Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you. Lord, what a beautiful thing it is to just to spend time to thank you for each one of my brothers and sisters here. As I see their faces and as I see Jesus in them, smell Jesus, hear Jesus. In each one of them. And just to know that these people, they're here because they love you. And I know that we all need you. And I know that we want more and more of you. I know we have come to a place in our lives that nothing out there, nothing, and that means absolutely nothing, can compare to the joy of being in your presence. I'm sure many of us, if, if not all of us here, will do this every day if we have the opportunity. For it is in the fellowship of the saints that we can see Jesus and the love of Jesus real as we minister to one another, praying for one another. Sometimes we just weep with one another. Sometimes we rejoice with one another. And sometimes we don't even know what to say. We just, we just know that we trust you. Even if it's difficult to express with words, our hearts just trust you and we thank you and we praise you. And if there's one thing we ask you is to give us the strength to keep on doing this and to go deeper yet deeper still with you we don't want to know you from a distance we don't want nobody to tell us that you are sweet we want to taste and we want to see that you are good we have tasted and we want more and more and more so thank you blessed be your name as you gather together here with your people I know we put a smile on your face every time we gather at your feet to learn from you and to praise you and to worship you. So have your way with your people. Teach us from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 14 in the book of Ezekiel. We're going to do just chapter 14. Hopefully we'll finish it. But, but in Ezekiel, we're going to see what I think is one of the amazing uh, teams in this chapter, chapters 12, 13, 14. Next week, we're going to be in chapter 15, 16, and 17. And those three chapters, they kind of like go together because they are chapter 15, 16, and 17. They are parables. Uh, chapter 15 is the parable of the vine. And that's going to be easy. But if anything, read chapter 15 and 16. Chapter 16, uh, you're going to have to read chapter 16 in a couple of sittings. I don't think you're going to be able to read the whole thing without saying seriously. Uh, because, I mean, uh, anybody read chapter 16, 16 ahead? If you haven't, that's fine. I mean, it's heavy. It is heavy. But, uh, but it's going to be awesome. So next week, chapter 15 and 16, if, if that. Hopefully 17 too, but for sure 15 and 16. But tonight we're going to be in chapter 14. And in chapter 14, if we're going to remember something, remember this from chapter 14, is the need for all of us to remain faithful. If we have a title for this, and normally on Wednesday nights we don't put titles because we don't know if we're going to do one chapter, two chapters, three chapters, whatever. So, but in this case, if we have to put a title to chapter 14, it will be remain faithful. faithful. No matter what, remain faithful. Even though the world will continue to grow more hostile toward uh, God's message, his message of righteousness, his message, message, message of holiness, and, and you will see more and more uh, uh, hostility against that. Yet the Bible calls us to continue to live righteous and godly lives because you never know when God is going to use you. You never know when you're going to be in a situation when uh, your righteousness, your holiness, even, even if it's just you setting apart from sin in a simple way, you never know when that's going to be uh, a testimony or when that's going to be a blessing to someone. And not too long ago, Lily and I, we were at this restaurant and um, she wanted something to drink and she said, I'm going to go grab something to drink. I go like, do not, whatever you do, do not grab anything that is in a can. 
just grab those things over there. You know, they have those cups and stuff. Why? I go like, because there are so many cans here that I've never seen before. I don't know what they are. They might not be soda, okay? So stay away from can. And we're just like that. And, and there we are. And then in front of us, there's this one family. And I mean, they started talking. You know, when someone wanted to say something, but they are not really, you know, brave enough to ask or something, we seen them. It was the, the husband, wife, and, and three kids. And they're like, <laughs> and we're like, a distance from them, I can see that. I go like, these people, man, they're weird. I know what they're talking, they're talking about us, but I don't know what's up. <laughs> Lily said, don't say anything, you know, because she, <laughs> and that's fine. And then before long, the guy said, hey, listen, uh, my wife and I, we were talking, and uh, I just have to ask you this. Are you in a Calvary Chapel? Now, this is in Texas, okay? Yeah. Uh, do you happen to be a pastor in Calvary Chapel? <laughs> yeah. Did you go to Calvary Chapel La Havre and uh, you know th this time? And did you share there? Yes. Didn't you just recently went to this other Calvary Chapel? And did you share that? Y yeah. I knew it. The wife says, "I knew it. We know you. You're a pastor." And blah blah blah. And go like, oh. I said, Lily, see, what if you went in there, grab one of those things, and it's something else, not, not a soda pop or something? They would be saying, like, aha, they have to come all the way here to do their drinking and stuff. <laughs> I mean, seriously. And I'm like, I mean, you got to be kidding me, man. I wanted to get away so that I can eat like a pig, and, and then here I am. <laughs> anyway. But the way, the way I say that in a funny, in a funny way is because you never know. But even if nobody knows you, tell you what, God sees you and he knows you. And that's what we're going to see here in chapter 14. We're going to see these people who are supposed to be the leaders of Israel, that, that at, a, at a given time in history, because of everything that is going on in the nation of Israel, they go before the prophet. In those days, if you wanted to inquire of God, you will go before the prophet of God to ask, hey, can you... Please go before the Lord and have him, you know, say whatever he has for us or whatever. You know, you will go before the prophet and the prophet will go before the Lord on behalf of the people. Anyway, we're going to see the leaders that they come before God and they're going to say, Hey, uh, uh, Ezekiel, will you please go and inquire of God about our, our condition, our situation, our circumstances, and da, 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 da. Well, by the time they come, God is already not happy with them. Because God is going to say, are you inquiring of me? And look at the condition of your heart. So, did we pray already? I think we need to pray again. Father, teach us we pray. These things are heavy in our hearts. And it might sound funny and all that kind of stuff. But at the end, there's nothing funny when you point to the things in our hearts that we've been harboring there. That we've been hiding so that we think. Even here at church. That we walk through those doors and we bring a whole bunch of stuff in our hearts that have nothing to do with you. Even in our prayers sometimes, we ask you for self-satisfaction, for the things we dream of, for the things we want. And sometimes we are so greedy that we don't even know. And so, Father, please open our eyes to see and our hearts to receive your truth. Teach us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Chapter 14, now verse 1 says this, Now some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. This is Ezekiel saying that. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired at, of at all by them? Notice what, what they're going to say. So they go before Ezekiel and they said, Ezekiel, see, they, 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 are, they, they appear to be religious. They are pious people. They are like, oh, we just want to know the will of God. And we, I mean, seriously. And they're going before the Lord. They want Ezekiel to go and ask the Lord. And the Lord says, Ezekiel, you see what's going on here? These men, they have idols in their hearts. Now, remember, one of the things why they are in captivity is because they're idolatry. One of the reasons why they end up in this situation is because they're idolatry. For years, 
Jeremiah has been saying, get away from the idols. Let go of your idols. Cast them away. Get rid of them. Burn them. Throw them away. At the beginning of the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is there and God says, Jeremiah, look at your people. And he says, how in the world can they be so idolatrous? Paraphrasing. God says, what is it that I, when did I fail? What they needed that I never gave them. And he doesn't understand that. And he says, see, there's nothing but an idolatry. I mean, an idolatrous nation here. And so here they come. They want to appear religious. They want to appear pious people. And they say, you know what? We, we just want to be in the ways of God and all of that. But notice what the Lord says. They keep in their hearts those little idols that they used to worship. And remember, most of these idols that we're talking about here, most of those idols are with a, a, a sexual immorality type of connotation to them. It's not like the idols that you see nowadays. Uh, they, they, they were just these gross uh, creatures and things like that. that they, they carve images and it's just immoral. Now they don't have the actual idols with them per se, because they left them in, back in Jerusalem. Now these are the people in captivity. Yet they go before the Lord, and they're like, yeah, can you, can you just go before the Lord? We want to know. And the Lord says, I see that in your hearts. You don't have the actual idols, but you carry them in your hearts. Ay, ay, ay. So Ezekiel is facing a very difficult situation in his day, during his ministry. That no matter what he said, no matter how much he, he, he preaches the word, how much he speaks the word of God, how much he, he, he says, thus says the Lord, two things are going to happen. The people are not going to repent, mm, nor they are going to change their ways of idolatry. They will not repent. They will not listen. And sad to say, they had reached a point of no return. And you have to understand, when God sees an individual or a society or a nation reaching the point of no return, God, he is a gentleman. And he will never force anybody to be saved. But he loves you so much. But he created, he created you to his image. He's the sovereign God of the universe, but he created you to his image. That means he gave you free will. And though those things seem to be, uh, you know, antagonistic, to an, they, 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 they run parallel and they are equally balanced. His sovereignty is exercised in the way you exercise your free will. And God says, I'm not going to force you. I want you to know and to come because you want to. And here's the people of Israel. But these men, these are the leaders. Keep that in mind. These are the leaders, and it says they, uh, they are putting before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired of at all by them? Now, verses 4 to 5. Therefore, speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Every one of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity and then comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols. That I might seize the house of Israel by their heart, because they are all estranged from me by their idols. So Ezekiel 14 is going to tell us two things. Number one, the first part of the chapter is going to talk about the, the, the prophecy against the idolatry of the leaders. And the second half of the chapter is going to tell, tell us about the certainty of the destruction of Jerusalem. Because... Their refusal to repent. And in Ezekiel 14, the Lord is going to give us the, the reason why his judgment upon Israel was so severe. So we, we can see from our side. And you, as, as we go through chapter 14, I want you to keep in mind this one truth. That just as God judged the nation of Israel because of their idolatry, so too God still judges nations today. God judges individuals. Make no mistake about that. And this is what we're going to see here as we continue in our reading. Shall I let myself be inquired of at all by them? And the Lord, it, it, the Lord is, not, is not happy with this. Shall I speak to them with their idols in their hearts? What good is it? 
To what benefit? What does it profit a man to hear what the word of God says if, if his, his, his heart is packed with idols? Now, I know we are quick and easy to point fingers at people because of their idolatry. And we see things and we're like, ah, ha, ha, we're not, we don't have a religion, we have relations, and all of that kind of stuff. But you don't have to carry an idol necessarily in, in the form of an object. But if you're not careful, the worst form of, form of idolatry is the worshiping of you. When you sit in the throne of your heart, when you rule, when you live for you, when it's all about you. And if you're not careful, the way you pray even reflects that it's all about you. Give me, fix me, help me, lead me in all of these things. Now, is it wrong to ask for things? No, it's not wrong at all. But in the asking of things, we also have to question the motivation of what we are asking. Give me for what purpose? Lead me where? And if we're not careful, then we fall into a form of religion. And we're no, no better than, than any other religion. And in my opinion, with all respect, I think it is the worst form of, of idolatry when we're pretending that we're doing something. At least the, the other people, they do it openly. And they're not ashamed of that. But the, the reason why I, why I wanted to spend the time here with these verses is because, because God sees it all. He knows. In, in the first commandment, the Lord says, you shall have no other gods before me. That principle applies everywhere. Whether it's the Old Testament, whether it's the New Testament. Whether it's individually, as it's called corporate for the church. Whether it's in America or China. And the second of those commandments, it says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. For I, the Lord, your God, I am a jealous God. Now, these people had idols before, and they were removed, but they kept those idols in their hearts, refusing all the time, the, the, the warning after warning after warning, from not only from Jeremiah, from Ezekiel, and from the other prophets in the past. Get rid of your idols, destroy them. They never listened. So they are now in that spiral, descending spiral of idolatry, and it's going it's deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Have you checked your heart lately? Wouldn't that be cool if we can somehow have an x-ray of our hearts right here, right now? If there was a way for me to be in front of you and that you can see with an x-ray what's in my heart, Will I be okay with that? Do I really want God's glory above all things? Is there ever a time when I'm more concerned about me than his glory? And this is the season. Don't get me wrong. I thank God for all the decorations and the, the talented people that we have and the Christmas trees and all that. I thank God for all of that. But I'm also concerned about how easy we deceive ourselves thinking that this is what it's all about. And now it's Christmas that we celebrate. It's Christmas. What's behind Christmas? Well, it's the party. It's the family. It's the gifts. It's the, it's the, the, you dress cool because it's Christmas, you know, and, and all that. We can easily be moved from the main thing. Pastor Chuck used to say, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing, and the main thing is Jesus. They had to leave their idols behind, but they carry those idols in their hearts. And the idols can be those things that master your life, uh, um, those things that are, are becoming your passion, uh, the things that, that, that drive you to do whatever you do, uh, those things that give you satisfaction, an idol is the thing that, that takes the place of God in your life. And if we're not careful, listen, if we're not careful, marriage becomes our idol. Children become our idols. We've got to be careful.
Because a lot of people go to church, and that's fine. It's okay. But let me tell you something. Going to church is not going to make you any better. If when you go to church, you don't bring your heart before the Lord in the morning. If you ever get up in the morning, if you have no idea, no clue into your wife or your husband, to, hey, shape up. It's time to go to church. Oh, I forgot that it was Wednesday. Then it means nothing. And you're probably thinking, like, what's the matter with him? No, I'm just being family. Is that okay that we can talk like that? Because it happens to the best of us. It happens to all of us. We just go to church. We're not taking the time to examine our hearts before the Lord. We are not taking the time in the morning to, to really seek his face. We're not taking the time to really go about the text. Even not taking the time to really go about, God, it's been a couple of days that I have not heard from you. I know you're here. I know my heart rejoices because you're, I know you're here. I don't see you, but I know you're here. But will you please just say something to me? So many times our prayer reflects really the idol that is in our hearts. Now, the worst thing that can happen to you is if God in his grace grants you the prayer of your heart. When your heart is not right with him. If God was to answer you according to what's in your heart. If he will do that for me, I know it will destroy me. Because God says here, I will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols. An idol will separate you from God. Idols will keep you away from God. Idols will become something that is keeping you from having that intimacy with God. It comes between you and God. And it is a false God that takes the place of God. And it fills your heart, your mind, your passions, your life. And it is a cheap substitute because it separates you from the true living God. Verse 6, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent. That word there, repent, is S-H-U-V in, in the Hebrew. It's only mentioned 10 times in the Old Testament. Unlike repent in the New Testament, you have about... Uh, over a thousand times when the word repent repeats in the, in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, that word repent, S-H-U-V in the Hebrew, is only used ten times. And in those ten times, it means turn back from evil and turn back to God. This is what the Lord says. Stop. And, and it says right there actually in the verse, turn away from your idols and turn your faces away from all your abominations. For anyone of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel who separates himself from me and sets, sets up his, his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity and comes to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. Listen, if you are in a state of idolatry, if you are living for self, if you are uh, just in the flesh, there's no pastor, there's no preacher, there's no prophet that can help you in any way whatsoever. Because if anybody, a pastor, a leader, a brother, a father, a mother is interceding for you, God overrules that and he says, I know him and I'm not going to answer him other than according to the idols of his heart. God says right here, I will answer him by myself and that by deeds when God answers you with I mean, by himself. God says, understand your condition. Look at the, the, uh, uh, the morality. Look at the idolatry. Look at the, look at the wickedness of your heart. No, there's no, I mean, there's no coincidence why the Bible says the heart is wicked. Do not trust them. And the Lord says, turn back from evil. Walk away from that and ask God for forgiveness. 
Ask God to take it away. The, the problem is that your idols are so rooted and ingrained in your heart, you cannot give up on them. You cannot give them up just because you're, you know, one day you said, okay, I'm done with this. No, you can't. Particularly the idol of self. The only hope is repentance. To turn back from evil. And for that you don't even have the strength. It has to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. And for that you don't even see the, 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 the depth of your wickedness. If it's not by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you will never know what it is. Unless it is by the truth of the word of God. You will never have a desire to get rid of it. Unless you're filled with the will of God. The desire to be in the will of God. Repentance has always been God's message to his own people. Those who profess to be his, the Lord continuously said, turn back. Turn back. Verse 8, I will set my face against that man and make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. The Lord says, I know what's in their hearts. They come to me. I'm going to overrule whatever preacher, prophet, or pastor, or leader says. And I will take it upon myself, God says, to answer that person. And I'm going to cut him off. Cut him off from among my people. Why? So that in the executing of his judgment, his righteous judgment for that matter, the people around that person will know, oh, he surely has offended the God of heaven and earth. And he never got away with that. I will set my face against that man. You don't want to ever find yourself. Why? Because the man whose heart is divided in his allegiance to the Lord will receive no knowledge <laughs> through a prophet. But God will be answering him personally in deeds. The Bible says, Woe unto him who strives with his maker. When God sets his face against a man, ah, uh, It's not a good thing. Verse 9. And if the prophet is induced to speak anything, I, the Lord, have induced that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people, Israel. I mean, he, this, this is kind of heavy. If, if, say, in the case of us now, pastors, say that I have a couple that say, you know what, we want to have some marriage counseling with you because we're having marital problems. And it happens that they are my really good friends. And they walk into the office and you know what? This is what we've been doing. And I said, hey, don't worry about it, man. We all have issues. Just have fun. Go home. You'll be okay. Then I'm going to have to deal with God. Because the Lord is going to say, is that the counsel I wanted you to give them? Or was it the truth that, that they needed to hear? See, it, it is not popular to tell the people what they need to hear. What is more popular nowadays is to tell people what they want to hear. And that's the problem here with the prophets. Remember, there is a seduction of the, uh, of the false teachers here in chapters 11, 12, 13, and 14. He's dealing with that issue. But the Lord says, I am against him. Verse 10, and they shall bear the iniquity. The punishment of the prophet should be the same as the punishment of the one who inquired. If one comes and we fail to give him, and that's for you too as, as a dad or as a mom, or as a husband or as a wife, a friend or brother or sister or mom or whatever. When you speak and you say, well, you know what? I, I don't think God is going to be mad because it, you be careful what you say. Because God not only going to punish that person, and, and to me, punish is not to destroy that person, but he, he, God will discipline that person. And so at the same time, he's going to discipline you. Listen, please, dads, mom, I mean, dads first. Don't put on your wife the heavy burden of be the one who makes the discipline, enforces the discipline, and, and brings correction to the kids. That's your God-given responsibility. You're putting her in a place that, 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 that she's not supposed to be doing. She ought to have all the, the trust and the confidence that, 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 that she's under the protection of the husband, who's the spiritual pastor, the spiritual leader of the family. 
And just because you tell your kids the truth, that doesn't mean that you don't love them. And I tell you, tell them the truth. And they're going to, I hate you. Oh, you're not like my dad, so I'm like my friend's dad. They are cool and they are the, whatever. You're my son. This is my roof, my rules. I pay for your food, for your bed, for your clothing, and I pay for everything. You live with me, you do what I say. I hate you. That's okay. One day you're going to have kids and you're going to hear the same thing from them. Until then, I'm just going to sit tight here and trust in the Lord. And moms, please, don't play games with your kids. Mom, I asked daddy, give me $40. Uh, what did he say? He said, no. Okay, here, but don't tell him I give you. Dad says 7 p.m. Okay, you, if, if you're here by 10, it should be okay. And he shows up at 1 o'clock in the morning. Don't tell dad. Okay, don't say anything. You ought to be one. The Bible says husband and wife, there ought to be one. One in their relationship, one in their decision, one in their determination, determination to honor the Lord in everything. The prophet will be punished. Same with the one who was inquiring here. 11, that the house of Israel might no longer, be, uh, no longer stray from me, nor profane anymore, all their transgressions, but that they might be my people and I might be their God, says the Lord. The whole purpose of this is God says, all I want is for you to walk. Remember what I said uh, a couple of weeks ago? What are the statutes of God? Those are the boundaries for holiness. God says, do, do not depart from this here. I will lead you. I'm walking in front of you. I'm leading you. But all you have to do is you walk within this, those boundaries. If you, if you stay within the boundaries, it's not going to be easy, but we'll get there. We'll be fine. We'll be okay. Anything comes against you, any obstacles, any difficulties, any circumstances, God says, since I'm leading you, let me deal with those things. They're my problem, not yours. God takes it upon himself, the responsibility, kind of like he puts himself under the obligation to take you safely. That's what the Bible says. The Lord is my shepherd. He's doing the leading. And he's doing the protecting. He's doing the providing. He, he's doing all of that. And he will lift you up if you can't make it anymore. But once you step outside of the boundaries that God established for holiness, then you're on your own. I know God is going to bring you back. This one lesson I, I shared with my son when, you know, there, there was a day when he was like messing around with things. He grew up in church. When we were doing Spanish ministry, he was our worship leader. That kid play, started playing guitar when the guitar was bigger than him. And he was a godly kid. He was just great. And the moment we took off to Panama, uh, not even a year after, he decided that he wanted to go and taste the world. And it brought so much pain to Lily and I, because he's our only child. And Lily would say, deal with him. Come on, be a dad. And I said, no. Why? I go, he's 18. I put, in, I put him in the altar, on the altar. I want him to taste God's discipline. Mm -hmm. And finally he says, how come you don't say anything? Yeah, you don't care. Huh? I go like, no, I do. I don't say anything to you, but I do say a lot to him. To who? To God. He just entrusted us with you for 18 years. You know what? We're done. <laughs> You're on your own, buddy. And guess what? I'm just watching from the sidelines. If you fumble, that's your problem. Don't say that to me. I go like, no, it's easy. Trust me, I wanted to do other things. But that day, 2 a.m. in the morning, he pulls out his guitar. And from 2 to like 3.30, he's like, oh, worshiping God. And he's like, Dad, I want to talk to you. No, nah, not today. Tomorrow morning, I'm tired. No, I prayed and I, you know, I asked the Lord to restore me. And I go, good for you. We'll see you in heaven. Now let me go back to sleep. <laughs> because we have to speak the truth. We have to put them face to face with the Lord. And we have to make them understand, you're not mine. You're his. You belong to him. And one thing I did say to him, I said, listen, God says in his word 
that those who come to him, he will by no means reject or cast them away. And then he says that you're in his hands and nothing can separate you from his hands. Now, son, here's the thing. He will bring you back. Whether he's going to bring you back in a stretcher, in an ambulance, in a bag, I don't know. All I know is that even if I don't see you here, I will see you there. Because I trust in my God that he's faithful. Verse 12, now the word of the Lord came again to me saying, Son of man, when a land, that word there, when a country, here we go now, when a man, when a land, when a country sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, that is what the Lord is going to do. I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off his supply of bread, send famine on it, and cut off man and beast from it. Now, if that doesn't scare you, there's something wrong with us. A lot of people are so alarmed because the level of inflation in the last 15 months has been unheard of. Let me just tell you, that's just the beginning. If the Bible is true, and I know it is, the Lord says clearly here, this has to be one of the most scary verses in the Bible for the United States of America. When a country sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. And so many times we have asked ourselves, who, what nation is capable enough or producing uh, weapons of mass destruction to really defeat the United States. No nation, perhaps, but no nation need to. Because when the Lord's hand is against a nation, ask the Romans, or the Greeks, or Babylon, or the Medes and the Persians. And are we seeing the beginning of these things here? It's got enough the supply of bread. Listen, I still believe the COVID was a man-made uh, 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 manipulation of things. I still believe that. And for, 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 for about a year and a half, we saw how desperate, I mean, when, whenever you see the world that is desperate for toilet paper, and I'm not being funny, when you see the world desperate for to toilet paper, what are they capable of doing for bread? I mean, you think that was just coincidence? No. It's these evil people just, 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 you know, just putting things out there to see how people are going to react. Now, we don't understand what famine is all about because we are living in, still in the land of abundance. But when the Lord says enough, it's enough. Famine. And the Lord says, and cut off man and beast from it. Verse 14. Notice this. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they will deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. If I cause wild beasts to pass through the land, and they empty it, and make it so desolate that no man might pass through because of the beast, even though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they will deliver neither sons nor daughters. Only they will be delivered, and the land will be desolate. Or if I bring a sword in that land and say, sword, go through the land and I cut off men and beasts from it. Even though these three men were in it as I live, says the Lord God, they will deliver neither sons nor daughters, but only they themselves will be delivered. Or if I send pestilence into the land and pour out my fury on it in blood and cut off from it men and beasts, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were there, were in it as I live, says the Lord God. They will deliver neither son nor daughter. They will deliver only themselves by their righteousness. Hmm. Why the mention of Noah and Daniel and Job? Noah was a righteous man. And right before the flood, the Bible says in Genesis 6, and Noah found favor in the eyes of God because he was a righteous man. And then the Hebrews are going to tell us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And he was not able to save the world. 
He was only able to put his family in the ark. Daniel, and it's, it, it's amazing because at this time, Daniel was still alive. And Daniel, even though he was still a young man, he was already a man of quite a reputation of being a righteous man. Daniel, even in his righteousness, now you remember the prayer of Daniel in chapter 9, I mean, amazing. He says, to us belong the shame of our faces. We fail. You did nothing wrong. You're holy. You're righteous. And a beautiful prayer. But even Daniel in his righteousness, he couldn't save his people from not going into captivity. He was only able to save those, those, those three friends of his. Remember that for a short period of time. But he, he had to go through these fires of, uh, of tribulation uh, as he finds himself in the lion's den and, and all of these things. Job was a righteous man. The Lord, the Lord said of Job himself, look at him. Look at my faithful servant, Job. There's no other man like him. And yet he was not able to prevent his children from getting killed when the house collapsed. It's so what the Lord is saying here. <laughs> when a man sins against spiritual light, he brings upon himself spiritual blindness. When, the, when men violate the one principle that says, no other gods before me, God is going to bring judgment. And just because people quote scripture, right here, these prophets, these false prophets are telling the people of Israel back in Jerusalem, eh, eh, relax, everything's going to be okay. Jeremiah says, you're not going to be okay. If you want to save your life, you better, listen, you, you be, better pay attention to what God is saying. Look, half the people is already in captivity. You think we're going to be okay? False prophets will come to the king and say, ah, it's okay. Don't listen to Jeremiah. Actually, put him in prison because all he says is bad stuff. <laughs> and that's what they did. Just because, because someone quotes the scripture, that doesn't make him a true prophet of God. Remember that. The devil himself quoted scriptures when he, wanted to, when he was tempting Jesus. C.S. Lewis used to say there are only two kinds of people. Those who say to God, your will be done. And those to whom God says, all right then, have it your way. <laughs> when people don't, don't want to have nothing to do with the truth, they are already deceived. And God says, you want to be deceived? Go ahead. When you read 2 Thessalonians and you're going to start reading about Antichrist, one of the, the most powerful things he's going to use is deception. And the way, the way he's going to be able to deceive people is because, number one, those that are here, they have rejected the truth. That's the reason they're here. And a lot of those in those days, when Antichrist is, is having his way with people, a lot of those, let me, let, let me say this loud and clear, a lot of those people in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 are going to be people who spend many years in church, but not one day in the truth. They are the ones that said, oh, I'll take my chances. I'll have another opportunity to receive Jesus in the tribulation, so I'll be okay. No, you're not. If you're left behind, number one is because you rejected the truth, period. And you read Romans chapter 1 from 18 to 25, and the Lord says, you knew God and you didn't glorify him as God. And you want to be smart, you want to be wise in your own understanding, the Lord says, I'm giving you up. And then he says, God gave them over to a debased mind, a mind who produces nothing. And so we are, here we have the, 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 the issue of these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job. Noah, though righteous, he could not make intercession that will avail when the world was being drawn. Daniel, he could not prevent the captivity of his people. Job, he could not preserve his children from getting killed. And that's the point here. The holiness of any man can only obey for himself. Your kids are not going to go to heaven because you're a godly man because you're a godly woman. Your wife is not going to go to heaven because you're a godly husband. You, your husband is not going to go to heaven because you're a godly wife. You will be a testimony to them. The point is the intercession of even of the holiest men cannot <laughs> stop God's 
righteous judgment. And here, let me tell you something. You're probably thinking, wait a minute. I, I know the intercession of Jesus, and he intercedes for us, and there's no, nothing more powerful than Jesus interceding for us, right? That's true. And the Bible, in James 5, 16, and Matthew chapter 18, I think is verse 20 or 21 or 20, it talks about the, 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 the faithful prayers of a godly man. And, and we know that. And the power of prayer when we all come together in one mind, one heart. Yeah, I, I get that. But let me ask you something. When Jesus is going down from the Mount of Olives towards the city of Jerusalem, and he stops and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, they kill the prophets. How many times I wanted to gather together? Why was he weeping for the city of Jerusalem? Why was he weeping? And what happened to the city of Jerusalem after they crucified Jesus and all of this in the year 70? What happened to it? I'm not saying that Jesus' power to intercede for us is, 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 avails to nothing. But what I'm saying is this. God in his justice, God in his righteousness, because he's a righteous God, he must, he must judge sin. And if Jesus is interceding for us because we're saved, because we're his, we might lose our intimacy, our place of fellowship with him. We'll never lose our position with him. You understand that? That's what the Bible says. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Galatians, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Romans, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. No condemnation, no separation. In Christ. Yeah, because we're believers. We are in Christ. But as far as interceding for a nation, interceding for people, if there's no repentance, there's nothing else left for that person or for that people, that judgment. That's not his heart for, he, he wants none to perish, but he wants all to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and to repent. And so that's what the Bible says here. Anyway, what verse? 21. Thank you so much. For thus says the Lord God, how much more it shall be when... I send my four severe judgments on Jerusalem. What are these four severe judgments? Number one, the sword. Second, the famine. Third, wild beast. And fourth, pestilence. To cut off men and beasts from it. Now, you want to be something interesting? Take that to Revelation chapter 6 and see if there's any parallel between these things. Interesting. And then verse 22, Yet behold, there shall be left in it a remnant, who will be brought out, both sons and daughters, surely they will come out to you, and you will see their ways and their doings. Then you will be comforted concerning the disaster that I have brought upon Jerusalem, all that I have brought upon them. Now, there are two takes on this. Some teachers said that this is this remnant here, and, and I don't agree with that view. They said this remnant here is those, is those wicked people that somehow escaped uh, the, the, you know, when the final siege in Jerusalem and they, they escaped and they ended up in captivity in Babylon. And the, when, when Ezekiel sees them there, he's going to see how they live in a wicked way. And Ezekiel is going to be encouraged. He said, God was righteous in bringing judgment. I don't think that's the, that's my opinion. I don't think that's, that's the, the thing. Because he says here, notice, notice carefully what he says. There shall be in it a remnant. And when it says remnant, God speaks of a remnant in the positive side. The remnant is those faithful who are in, in, in among the, the, the nation of Israel. There was this bunch of people. Now, remember a previous ver, uh, chapter or two before that the Lord said, Go throughout the city and find those who are righteous and put a mark on their foreheads. Remember that? And so the Lord is speaking about a remnant. So, so if we are uh, consistent with, with the context of this, these will be those who are faithful to God. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, when he came, he treated Jeremiah even with much respect. And he, he gives orders to his generals. He says, look at Jeremiah. Give him everything he needs. Do not, he says, do not treat him badly. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that because of the context is like that, that these are faithful people who are faithful to God, and, and because God protects them, there's small little remnant, and when they come, 
to uh, uh, captivity, and, and, and Ezekiel gets to see them, they're going to tell Ezekiel, it's horrible back there. You should see the abominations. You should see the idolatry. You should see, because God is saying that. He says he sees that. And so he says, they will encourage you when you see them. Verse 23, and they will comfort you when you see their ways and their doings. Yeah, and you shall know that I have done nothing with all cause that I have done in it, says the Lord. Now, quickly, please, because we only have a few minutes. Turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you don't mind. Do you mind? Okay, good. See, I, I told you, I mean, you're, you're, I mean, you're just wonderful people. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter 3. You there? What do we do? How do we live godly, righteous lives in the midst of this wicked generation? How do we go about serving the Lord, worshiping God, and going about living our lives for Jesus Christ? Well, Second Timothy chapter 3, these are the instructions from Paul to Timothy. It says, Timothy, heads up. This is... You need to know, verse 1, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy men, unloving, unforgiven, slanderers. You know what the word for slanderers is? Devils. They are unloving, they are inhuman, they are devils, they are arrogant, they are abusive, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. Now, Timothy, this is instruction from such people, what? Turn away. Don't hang out with them. Why? So that you don't become like them. And this is the instruction. How, how do we go about living our lives for Jesus Christ in, in, in the midst of a wicked generation like this? First, you have to know. What do you have to know? In order for you to know is that you got to have discernment. And you can never have discernment if there is not first a delight in the word of God, Psalm 1. You have a desire, Peter says, you got to have a desire as a newborn babe. you got to have a desire for the Word of God. And that desire becomes your delight. You, you can do nothing. You're miserable. You don't want nothing else but, but to spend time in the Word of God. Not to make yourself uh, you self-righteous. Because it is a desire. It is a delight of your heart. And that desire, that delight turns into discernment. And now you look into discernment. You have a biblical worldview. And no matter what the culture says, no matter what government says, no matter what the media says, no matter what people at church say and what they do, it doesn't matter what the pastor says. God gives you discernment that comes by the Spirit of God that lives in you. And with that, he's going to lead you, he's going to guide you. But I'm trusting my conscience. No, conscience is not an engine. Conscience is just a flywheel. <laughs> it does nothing if it doesn't have an engine. And the engine is the Spirit of God. Then if, if the engine is the Spirit of God, then your conscience will do good. But if you follow your conscience and your conscience is corrupted, you're in trouble. Knowledge, biblical knowledge comes from the exposure of yourself to the truth of the Word of God. Amen? So what do you say? Stay away from people like this. Don't become like that. Timothy, regardless of the way in which the message is received or is rejected. Timothy, you remain faithful. That's the same message to Ezekiel. Second Timothy chapter 4 now. And with this, we're going to start closing this. <coughs> Amen? Chapter 4, verse 1. How do we live godly lives righteously in the midst of this wicked and crooked generation? Chapter 4, I charge you, therefore, I, I am going to change my name to that. I'm going to be, therefore, Almazan. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. 
Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables and myths and lies and deception. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. It's not going to get easy, Timothy. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. That's the instruction for him. And those are the instructions for us. Proclaim the message. But before you can proclaim the message, you have to. Before you can do the talk, you have to do the walk. Talk the talk, but better than that, walk the walk. Proclaim the message, pers persist in it, whether it is convenient or not, whether it is popular or not. And I tell you, the teaching of the Word of God, day after day, is becoming more unpopular than ever before. People like to go to churches that do the jambalaya and those things. That's their problem. That's their problem. But when I step into the presence of God Almighty, one thing I don't want to hear is that he would say, I didn't ask you to entertain my people. I didn't ask you to deceive my people. I trusted you with my people, and I wanted you to teach the word of God. And I will say, I did it halfway, half Spanglish, half English. Lord, but I was faithful to just the reading of your word, because it is in that that we find eternal life and the truth that will guide us. Those words were written to Timothy almost 2,000 years ago. And they are so true for today. They will turn their ears away from the truth. They will not tolerate sound doctrine. But Timothy, regardless of how people respond, regardless of those so-called leaders and whatever they call themselves, Timothy, fulfill your ministry. Timothy, you be faithful. Don't worry about anything else. You be faithful. You continue to be faithful to God, even when most people are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. How are we going to do it? Hebrews 12. Did I say I was closing already? With this one, we do close. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Are we good? Yeah. All right. <sighs> Hebrews 12. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. All right. How in the practical? Ah, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's what we're going to do. Let aside every way and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And we're going to continue to run the, with endurance the race that is set before us. And no matter what, people, listen. Listen. No matter what. No matter what. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. And if... Six months from now, a year from now, or three months, or three days from now, or maybe tomorrow. I'm not here. You remember that every opportunity I had, I was encouraging you to keep your eyes on Jesus. And if it happens to be that you're going to be in the presence of God, and I don't get to see you before you step into eternal life, before you close your eyes, please, in the name of Jesus, Remember that I told you so many times, keep your eyes on Jesus. There's hope in no one else. There's hope in nothing else. Church, keep your eyes on Jesus. For tomorrow's guarantee for no one. Thomas Jefferson, in the year 1784, said this, Indeed, I tremble for my country when reflect that God is just. That his justice cannot sleep forever. 
He said that 239 years ago. And I pray that among us here in this church, men and women will commit themselves so passionately to the ways of Jesus Christ, to the word of God, and to the will of God. That we will have a burden for our people. We will have a burden for our nation. But even if nobody out there changes, even if nobody out there believes our message, so be it. We're going to fix our eyes on Jesus. So help us, God. Amen. Amen. <sighs> These are, the, 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 I don't know. I don't even know what to say anymore. Father, this is the kind of chapter that somehow makes us sick, sick good in our stomachs. As we consider the opportunity that is before us to be the people that you want us to be, the people filled with, filled with your truth, filled with your spirit. That we will have such passion for those who are lost. That we will go before you day and night. With a passion. That's beyond our strength. With a desire. That is bigger than our hearts. With an urgency that is greater than life. To have your name glorified. Whether we live or the way we die. That, that in all things, we will be people of the truth. And that you will continue to guide us and to lead us. And that is my prayer. That you will help me to remain faithful. Please, God, there is only one thing that I ask of you. Help me to remain faithful. To the calling to the ministry you have given me, faithful to this church, faithful to you, until the very last breath of my lungs, that I will finish the race set before me with the strength that you give me and the wisdom that comes from your spirit, with your truth in one hand, And with my other hand pointed people to Jesus Christ, the author and finish of our faith. So help us, God. Help us to be the people you want us to be. Help us to remain faithful to the end. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church.